So if, if at any point you want to interrupt with questions, please feel free. Uh, thank you all for coming, everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about two benchmarks that I have developed or been involved with developing over the past almost a decade, um, BSM Bench and Sombrero. This talk's been written quite quickly. I had less time than I thought because various technological challenges, so please excuse any hiccups that occur with the material or with my delivery of it. Like I said, if anything's not clear, please interrupt me and ask. So the outline of the talk I'm going to give today, first I'm going to try and give a brief introduction to lattice gauge theory. I'll then talk about HiRep, which is the lattice gauge theory code on which I've based these benchmarks. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about HPC benchmarking in general, the principles behind it, the th things I've tried to do. And then I'll talk about BSM Bench and then about Sombrero. So without further ado, I'm going to talk about lattice gauge theory. And I'm going to try and introduce this. It is a very large field uh, that is relatively difficult to understand unless you've done a lot of physics and a lot of mathematics. I'm going to try and cover it in 15 minutes, so wish me luck. So it's, it, it, it'll seem rather, rather, uh, rather like a joke, but to understand what lattice gauge theory means, we need to define three words, lattice, gauge, and theory. Now I'm going to start from the right and work backwards. So. Well, so when I say theory, I don't mean theory in the sense necessarily of a mathematical theorem or of the normal scientific usage of theory, which is something that describes the world. Instead, I'm going to use it to mean a set of laws of physics. So we define some system of equations, some, some set of principles that will then defi define for us a set of laws of physics that may or may not apply to the real world. So we hope, but we don't know a priori, that these are going to be consistent. Um, if they're not consistent, then we will define the theory as being sick, and we probably won't be interested in it anymore. Uh, we hope, but we don't guarantee that these theories are going to apply to reality. So there, there are theories that we think describe reality quite well, but when we're exploring the space of theories, we are looking for theories that may apply to reality. We don't know going in if they will, otherwise, we, we have finished our job already. Frequently, we motivate these theories by some kind of symmetry argument or other aesthetic argument that the theory is going to look nice, it's going to be beautiful, it's going to, but also we hope that it's going to describe reality. There's no point in having a theory that's beautiful but doesn't describe reality. Um, and most often, we'll define these in terms of some kind of an action or a Lagrangian function. So some mathematical function from which we can derive a set of laws of physics. And if action and Lagrangian function aren't familiar words to you, don't worry. They are not that important, other than the fact I will refer to them a couple of times later. You don't need to be able to use one. And it's going to take a lot longer than this talk to actually get to the point where you could. So, so the next word we need to define is gauge. So gauge is an arbitrary but necessary choice. So it comes from its usage, its etymology in physics comes from railways in the 19th century, where they needed to define the distance between two rails. And ultimately, it doesn't matter too much what that distance is. So you've got all of these different choices that different countries made on how far apart to space their rails. They're all equally valid. Um, but once you choose one, it's incompatible with a different one. So there's a choice that has to be made, but it's relatively arbitrary. So in this country, we had both standard gauge and broad gauge, with the two main ones, broad gauge being used by Brunel and standard gauge being used everywhere else. And eventually, we converted the broad gauge lines to standard gauge so that trains could run on both. So we fix a particular gauge, and that, that is a freedom that we have to choose. So in a gauge theory, so now I'm defining a group of two words, a gauge theory is a theory that has a gauge symmetry. So, specifically, we can make some kind of arbitrary choice at every point in space independently, and the resulting physics, the physics we get out, don't change because of this. So, looking at these two cylinders here, you can't see any difference between them. But you can see I've divided them into very thin slices. You can imagine these as being infinitely thin, 
And so at every different uh, point along the cylinder, I can twist the cylinder. And you can't see it because the cylinder is entirely white, but the cylinder is actually in a different configuration. It doesn't affect the fact that we have a cylinder at the end. If you were to draw some lines on it, then you could see there is a difference between the two, because on the right, I've twisted it, and on the left, it's straight. So I draw a straight line across, I twist the cylinder along, and I get a different configuration. I get a different state. I've chosen a different gauge. But the resulting cylinder, it's still a cylinder. It's the same cylinder. So when we can take a quantity and define it at each point in space, um, that's a field, and if that quantity is just a choice of this particular symmetry, then it's a gauge field. Uh, examples of gauge theories uh, include classical electromagnetism, that is a classical gauge theory, and quantum chromodynamics, the theory that governs quarks and gluons, the things that sit inside um, neutrons and protons in the atomic nucleus. So that theory is a quantum gauge theory. So a quick aside, because I probably will refer to it later, uh, is this idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So physics can drive a system to break a symmetry. So um, you can see this, this figure, this bucket-shaped figure, has a symmetry. I can rotate it around, the, around its center, and it doesn't change. So if I get my mouse here, I can rotate it around this point here, or a line through that point, and it will still look exactly the same. It will still be the same bucket shape. And if I stick a particle in this, in this bucket, it will oscillate up and down, and then eventually, if there's some kind of resistance, it will settle at the bottom. And so if I perform the rotation that keeps this bucket shaped exactly the same, that particle won't move, because it's sat right at the middle. It's sat right at the axis of rotation. But if, instead, I have this shape, so this was x to the 4, this is um, x to the 4, no, see, um, sorry, phrase it differently, this is x squared squared. This is x squared minus 1 squared, which introduces this extra hump. This has the same symmetry. If I rotate this around this point in the middle, or the line through that, then the hat Mexican hat, or wine bottle potentially it's called, wine bottle or Mexican hat, uh, will stay exactly the same shape. But if I put a particle at the top here, it's going to roll down, and it's going to settle in this valley. And so as I rotate the hat, then the point, the particle, will move round. So the symmetry has now been spontaneously broken, because I can't have a stable state that respects the symmetry. So I'm not going to rely on this idea very much, but this Mexican hat shape is going to come in handy later. So what about gauge symmetries? So it's the kinds of symmetries that we see that gauge fields will respect. So we describe these by continuous groups or Lie groups, and if you don't know what that means, don't worry. Uh, some examples of these are we have classify these as either abelian or non-abelian. So abelian groups, um, things like uh, I've lit, met, missed out a factor of i in here, e to the i times some scalar. Um, so that, that, that is an abelian group because the group elements will commute with each other. So if I've got two things of this form, that would be i there, um, then ab equals ba. I can shuffle things around without things breaking. And we can solve these analytically, which is, which is nice, which is a quality of theories that we like. Uh, when we go to non-abelian groups, so for example, quantum chromodynamics, the theory of the strong interaction, is described by a non-abelian group. So we can't solve these analytically, because these group elements no longer compete with each other. A times B isn't the same as B times A. And usually, uh, with these groups, the group elements are n, n times n matrices. So the three kinds of group that I'm going to mention today and that form the majority of the space of groups available are SON, which are real groups, respecting when you take the trans transpose of the matrix times, times the matrix, you get one, and it has determinant one. Then 
SUN, so the special unitary group, um, which are complex and have this behavior that when you multiply the dagger of the matrix times the matrix, you get one. Again, the dagger of a matrix isn't, its meaning isn't important, it's just a thing used to define this set of matrices. And then these symplectic matrices, which you can see are a subset of the unit, uh, special unitary matrices, but also have this property that uh, defines what, what it means to be symplectic. So we're going, to, we're going to be working with these three sets of groups uh, that are all described by n times n matrices. So something else that's useful to know uh, that when you add matter to your field, uh, well, sorry, you can transform a field under a particular representation of a gauge group. So you, 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 you're representing your group by, for instance, some n by n matrices, then you have to choose how your field transforms under that. So for instance, the trivial representation is it doesn't transform these two things are completely decoupled. So for instance, um, electrons aren't really affected by the matrices of QCD, so electrons transform in the trivial representation of the, the QCD gauge group. Then we have the fundamental representation, which is um, you represent the matrices as you define them, as n by n matrices. And then you have higher representations where you can take the n by n matrix or the set of n by n matrices that define your group and then express them as larger matrices instead. And that is sometimes useful because it gives different properties to the resulting theories that you get out. So, since I've mentioned it, quantum chromodynamics or QCD is the gauge theory where the gauge symmetry is SU3 and matter, and we call those the matter quarks, that they, they transform under the fundamental representation of that SU3 group. So when you hear about uh, lattice QCD, that's specifically a special case of a lattice gauge theory. Um, so when you, um, hear QC, when you hear QCD, read SU3 with fundamental. It, may, it makes some particular choices that then can make your code easy to optimize because you can write the special case rather than having to write the uh, generic case. So then the standard model, as, as with most of this talk, I am massively simplifying here, but it has the gauge symmetry SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. So it's got multiple different gauge groups going on. Um, you then have to define how all your matter transforms and you've got to add a Higgs boson to make it all work out. And this is currently the best description we have of reality, ignoring gravity. Um, there are ways of, in, in some particular circumstances, including gravity in this, but normally you don't think of them both at the same time. And it would be nice if we, if we had a grand unified theory that could combine the two. But that's way beyond this talk, so I'm not going to dwell on it. So. Uh, beyond the standard model is a term that I'm probably going to use at some point, and this is everything that's not the standard model, to some extent. It's, but specifically, it's theories that we study to try and resolve problems that we perceive in the standard model. So the standard model, so some people object to the fact that it is not particularly natural. Uh, they will use the word natural, and the definition is, again, a little bit complex for a non-specialist audience, but the basic idea is that we have to do a huge amount of fine-tuning. We have to subtract two incredibly large numbers and get a very small number, but not zero, um, in order to get out the mass of the Higgs boson that we see at the Large Hadron Collider. And some people think that's, um, that's that seems unlikely that the physics the, there's it indicates that there's something wrong with the theory, and try and find a theory where that mass comes out more naturally. It comes out as a consequence of the laws of physics rather than a parameter that's had to be tuned. And so the study of theories that could give that is one part of the understanding model physics. So I've defined gauge, I've defined theory, and I've defined gauge theory, and then I've waffled on a little bit about some gauge theories. So now I should explain lattice 
the final word of our three words. So this we define by analogy with crystallography. So you have a crystal lattice in crystalline solids, and then we take some of those methods and we apply them to gauge theories. And so we, you just use this to mean a regular array of points. In a crystal lattice, those could be atoms or they could be molecules. In our theory, it's just some points. And specifically, normally, we look at um, hypercubic lattices, so where it's all right angles in all dimensions, and then the distance to nearest neighbor is normally taken to be the same. You can take it to be different, but definitely hypercuboid is the, by far the most common. It's much more difficult to have any other structure of lattice, and we don't really do it very much. So, lattice gauge theory. Finally, we're at the point where we can define this field that I've been talking about for the last 15 minutes. So, this is a set of techniques for studying gauge theories that we've discretized on a lattice. So, quite often when you want to study any kind of um, model or any kind of theory or any kind of in most fields, when they put things in a computer, they will need to discretize in some dimensions. So you need to take your continuum of real space and divide it into discrete points. And that's exactly what we do in lattice gauge theory. Um, it was developed originally in the late 1970s, um, and it was developed from techniques in computational condensed matter physics. So looking at crystal lattices, we take some of those techniques and apply them to uh, our particle physics problems. Particle physicists are really good at that borrowing techniques from elsewhere and then completely bastardizing the language to make them refer to something completely different and using the techniques without, um, well, with uh, causing some upsets to the people who originally created them. We're especially bad at that with mathematicians. Mathematicians really don't like it when we borrow their technology and make it more useful. And this is the only first principles non-perturbative method to solve non-abelian gauge theories. So to solve things like QCD, the only way that we can go from first principles, from the laws of physics, and get to some numerical answers that we can compare with reality, um, without making certain approximations that you can make to it, um, called perturbation theory, which I'm not going to explain, um, this is the only way you can do that. So to go into a little bit more detail, on the right I've got a diagram of a lattice, and you can see I've labelled some sites. These are, these are points on our rectangular or hypercubic grid. Then we've got links, which are the... Um, some people will call them a parallel transporter, which isn't a very helpful way of describing it to people who don't know what that means. Um, the, the, the lines are joining adjacent sites. So the nearest neighbours are connected by what we call links. And if you take links and you go around the unit square, the smallest square that you can draw on this, la on this lattice, then you get what's called a plaquette. I don't think we'll actually really use the plaquette today, but um, I had this diagram to hand, so I used it. So when we start looking at a lattice gauge theory, then what we normally have is n by n matrices, one per link. So gauge fields live on the links rather than on the lattice sites, which is interesting. Normally when you're doing any kind of discrete problem, you'll have values at every site or at every point in your discretized space. Here, instead, things live on the links between them, so you have some more degrees of freedom. Uh, on the other hand, the matter fields are vectors that transform under whatever representation we choose of our gauge field. Um, and these sit on the sites. So these sit on the individual lattice points. So then what are derivatives in our continuum Lagrangian? So the thing we've used to define this theory will have some derivatives in. And these become nearest neighbor interactions. So these become finite differences, which become nearest neighbor interactions. OK. This means that our action is local. We don't have to have long range interactions. This means this has a lot of nice properties, one of which is we can partition our lattice in space and work on the partitions independently. This is really good when we come to parallelize it on a supercomputer, 
because superregions are really parallel, so we like being able to work on small segments of our global volume. Oh, something I've not mentioned, I've briefly mentioned it here, that we work in four dimensions. So because we're working with series that include uh, an element of special relativity, we need to treat time in the same way as we treat space. So time is just another direction. And specifically, we make the approximation, not approximation, we make a transformation of using what's called Euclidean time, where time is treated exactly the same way as space, not just the relativistic way where you stick a factor of i in front and so you can treat it in the same basis but it's slightly different. No, we make the transformation that we treat it as completely equivalent. All four directions have the same metric. So yeah, we work in four, di four dimensions usually. Uh, that means that we have four links per lattice site. So you can go up in the x, y, z and t direction and that gives you four links per site. You can also go down, but we store those links on the site in the other direction. So observables that we want to calculate here, for instance, we want to calculate masses and decay constants of some composite states. So we want to calculate the mass of the proton. We can do that. Um, the observables we want to calculate are normally things like path integrals. And when you want to calculate a path integral, you need to well, you need, firstly, you need to define how the path integral works. One way of doing this is via the lattice. And normally, when you, you want to calculate a difficult integral, you'll use Monte Carlo methods. And this is no different. We're using Monte Carlo integration. The action is also usually real. There are cases, there are, in fact, it's not usually real. The cases we usually study are real because they're easy. Uh, so with a real action, we can use important sampling which means we're doing, using Monte Carlo methods where we, we've got some probability weight, which means we can use particular algorithms that are well understood and work quite well. And in, in a Monte Carlo universe, what we do is we generate configurations of our gauge field um, that are represented of the distribution dictated by the action. So we're sampling from this probability distribution. We get a bunch of different samples via some Monte Carlo algorithm. And then by calculating our path integral, which is going to be some kind of sum of uh, or product of the cats across some shape, then we can get out uh, that observable for one configuration. And by doing that for all of our configurations, then we get some kind of statistical ensemble that will give us the right observable at the end. So taking the observable any one configuration doesn't make sense in the same way that taking one random number out of a box doesn't give you the overall statistical behavior. You need to take averages over your entire ensemble to get the value that you want. And <clears throat> we characterize our interaction between our gauge field and matter by our Dirac operator, which we call D. So this is at least typically a nearest neighbor interaction there are things you can do that might make it next to or next to next to nearest neighbor. So you might need to get extra, um, go, for, go further than your nearest neighbor. It's always going to be local, or it's almost always going to be local, because local is what we know how to do well. And inversion of this Dirac operator, D, is over 90% of our execution time. So if you compare this with pr uh, problems in other fields where you've got a whole bunch of different operations, each of which is taking maybe 10, 20% of execution time that you've got to optimize, we have a relatively nice problem that we have one, one thing, one matrix vector multiplication effectively, that dominates our execution time. So if we can make that go faster, then we speed up our program. Which is a nice problem to have. Unfortunately, it's, it's relatively easy to get to the point where it's quite difficult to optimize this function any further. So some practicalities about working on the lattice. Uh, typical volumes, 24 by 12 cubed is a very small volume these days, and 256 by 128 cubed I think is one of the largest volumes that you look at. And if you multiply those numbers together, um, 128 cubed times 256 is 536 million points, each of which will have a number of n by n matrices and a number of vectors on it. So you're, you're starting to get to relatively large 
data at this point. BSM stays on the small end of this. So the reason you would go to a large lattice is because you want to do high precision work. Um, <clears throat> and this is where we're looking at QCD. We're comparing with real life experiments. We want to get as close as possible, as small an error as possible so that we can make comparisons and see if there's any discrepancy. When we're doing explorative work to see just what a theory looks like, vaguely how it behaves, we can get away with using smaller volumes. Um, another interesting thing is Normally, when you're discretizing a problem, you set the lattice spacing. You choose it to be small, but not too small, uh, so you, can, um, you have that freedom of choice. Due to the way we have to set up a lattice gauge theory, we can't do that on the lattice. We set a physical parameter that has a physical effect of the unit we're looking at, and this actually controls the lattice spacing indirectly, which is a thing that we have to deal with. And Boundary conditions. Normally, when you discretize a space, then you'll have some fixed boundaries. Uh, on the lattice, it doesn't make sense to do this normally. Sometimes it does, most of the time it doesn't, depending on what observable you're looking at. And typically, we want periodic boundary conditions. So when you go off one edge of the world, you come back from the other end again. I'm trying to think, yeah, ima imagine you're living on a roll of film that's been taped together at the end. You walk off one side, you come back the other side. Similar to living on the globe, you, you, you go east, you keep going east, eventually you come back to where you started. But the geometries we're looking at are not spherical, they, they are hypercubes. So, in fact, they are hypertoruses in that sense. So, now I've introduced lattice gauge theory. We all now know what lattice gauge theory is to some extent. Um, I think hopefully we all understand it about as well as we can without doing multiple months of physics lectures, which I don't feel like doing anymore. So uh, let's talk about HiRep. HiRep is a piece of software or a set of tools and libraries performing computations in lattice gauge theories. Specifically, it can do SUN, SON, and SP2N gauge theories. So um, all of the ones that we can look at with square matrices. Um, we can do this with arbitrary n, provided n is an integer, as is usually implied by the letter n, um, and with arbitrary number of flavors of matter, and matter in any two-index representation. So I'm not going to explain what two-index representation means, but it's, um, it's a subset of representations, but it's most of the interesting ones. So this has been developed since 2007, I think. Um, there may be angry comments on this on the YouTube video version of this talk if I get that wrong, but it was first publicly released last year. So we've been doing research and working with it and publishing papers since 2007, eight time, but last year it's finally been released publicly to the world on GitHub. Um, it's written in C99. Um, it was, it's been written in C99 in the hopes of getting performance portability. And then it has a C++ and Perl code generator that I'll talk about a little bit more shortly. Uh, important things are it uses MPI for its space-time joint decomposition, so it does message passing with its partition space. And it has some limited OpenMP support. Its OpenMP is nowhere near as efficient as MPI is, so the only reason you use Open, OpenMP is if you're on a machine that doesn't let you use enough MPI ranks that you want. <coughs> So, what is this code generator? So, in this problem, we work almost exclusively with n by n and n by m matrices, with those numbers fixed for your entire research program. So, using uh, these are all used in really tight loops. So, if you use a general linear, linear algebra library like BLAS, then you're going to have a huge overhead because these are designed to work at any size matrix. So by writing specific um, um, codes for n by n and n by n matrices and hard coding that at compile time means we can get a massive speed up compared to having all of these branches everywhere. So we, what we do is we do our group theoretical stuff in C++, then we spit out what those operations look like for our particular choice of n and m, and then we do a whole bunch of dirty string manipulation in Perl 
glue some files together, and we get out a bunch of header files that define us some macros for doing these n, uh, n by n, n by n matrix, 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 and matrix vector operations. So how is this parallelized? Uh, we, so the MPI parallelization, we partition our global volume into equal sized chunks, which are going to be hypercuboids of some shape. We add a one side halo around the edge so that nearest neighbor interactions don't need to communicate to an adjacent process every time we do a comp computation. Instead, we can just update when the, the CPU is busy doing something else and come back to those sites once we've got the data available. We can grow that to two or three sites if we need to for uh, special actions that uh, are a bit fuzzier. Uh, we abstract away most of our MPI calls. So there is a communications library that has some higher level functions for, um, say, updating the halo for a particular field. Um, so we, we don't have to write a lot of MPI directly when we're writing high level programs in this, uh, against this library. And worth noting, not all of the tools that are in this um, package support MPI. So the really computational intensive ones, the, um, so the Monte Carlo, and then some of the more expensive observables will use MPI because otherwise things go far too slowly. But things that parallelize trivially um, or are otherwise very fast uh, don't support MPI because that would require significant extra debugging and it's quicker to get on with our lives and run it in serial or with something like getting parallel if we need the extra speed. So that's the MPI implementation. OpenMP, on the other hand, um, loops over the local volume, so the volume on a particular MPI rank. Those loops are defined as macros, so all of that is abstracted away. And those abstractions also include uh, some OpenMP pragmas, so those loops are done in parallel when OpenMP is used where it's possible. Some performance considerations. Again, I'm inferring this because I wasn't part of the original development team. It was developed before I started my PhD. Um, but my belief is that the design decisions have been motivated by what the developers thought was the case with compilers in the mid-2000s. So specifically, um, inlining wasn't that great at that point. C++ templates weren't that great at that point. Um, so instead, uh, the code makes really heavy use of preprocessor macros so that you don't have function call, deep, deep nested function calls in tight loops. Um, and so we have quite deep nests of macros calling macros calling macros. We also have macros defining other macros because rather than having parameters passed in, we, um, it's potentially faster to have these defined at compile time. Um, where there are loops in macros, for instance, looping over all the elements of a matrix or of a vector, uh, these are either partially or completely hand unrolled. Well, I say hand, Perl unrolls them, uh, depending on the size of the group. So there's some limit, I think it's four. If the group is four by four or smaller, then it's completely unrolled. If it's larger, then it's partially unrolled. And in the mid-2000s, C99 complex numbers weren't that well supported, they weren't that performant. So instead, we have our own hand-rolled implementation of complex.h. Um, the newest version of HiRep, the version that's on GitHub, actually has switched to using C99 complexes because now they are faster. Uh, so at some point, we will switch our development branch and our benchmarks to use C99 complexes instead. But for now, we're using the older custom complex.h. So that's a whistle-stop introduction to HiRep. Next, let's talk about benchmarking. So I've copied and pasted the definition of Wiktionary here for benchmark. The important one is number three, a computer program that's executed to, to assess the performance of the runtime environment. I want to see how fast a computer is doing a particular problem, so I run a benchmark. Okay, how, how, how do we do it? So. The principle is pretty simple. Pick a task, time how long it takes. If it goes quick, then it's better. If it goes slow, it's worse. Optionally, we can then invert that time to get a rate, and then we can multiply by an operation count to get an operation rate. So you will hear a lot of people talking about floating point operations per second or flops. That is, you divide the time taken 
no, you, di you divide the number of floating point operations that were in that problem by counting them up, you divide that number by the time it took, and you get the number of operations you do per second. Okay. That is a bigger is better number. So you, you hear about supercomputers having performance of petaflops and teraflops and heading towards exaflops, because we want to do as many floating point operations in one second as we can. So important principle here, runtime should be consistent between runs. So if I run the same benchmark twice on the same machine with the same conditions, I should get the same time out at the end. Also, if I have two machines that are equivalent, if I've got two, say I've got Hawk and I've got Sunbird, these are two machines with the same CPUs, with the same interconnect, with a relatively similar environment, I should get roughly, roughly similar performance between the two of them. We also ideally want to test that the benchmarks being executed correctly. Um, one reason is because we like vendors to optimize our benchmarks to show us how fast their machines can perform with if we worked on our code, and also because then they can feed that code back to us and make our code faster. And if they can make the code run faster by just removing the body of the loop, then something's gone wrong. So we need to test that things are still working correctly. Also, when we run these benchmarks on prototype hardware, we're not guaranteed that that hardware is going to work perfectly. So if we can spot any errors that machine is causing, we can point that out to the vendors and say, we can't buy this machine because it's not going to give us the right answer. So we have a whole spectrum of benchmarks that we can run. Uh, we have micro benchmarks where you run one really, really tiny piece of code that tests one particular characteristic very, um, very intensively. So this can show you the absolute limit of one part of a system. So for instance, you can test how fast you can get data in and out of it, or you can test how fast the CPU can go in ideal conditions, how many floating point operations you can do if you don't care about things like accessing memory and that kind of thing. So stream is an example of an IO benchmark. I don't have to hand any examples of CPU benchmarks that completely ignore memory bandwidth. Um, then at the other end, you've got application benchmarks, where you take some application doing some problem that you want to do, and you run it from beginning to end and see how long it takes. This is really good to see how well your component mix works, taking into account the fact you've got CPU, but the CPU can only go as fast as the memory can feed it data, and it can, if you're reading from the disk, you can only go as fast as the disk can feed you data, and all these things interact in a real program to have an effect on the performance. So Gromax and VASP are examples of this that are used quite frequently, both of which were used in the supercomputer world's procurement to decide which machine we wanted to get. Then in between these, we have um, a whole spectrum of uh, intermediary things. There are synthetic benchmarks where we combine lots of micro benchmarks to try and emulate a particular class of problem. And then we've got things like component benchmarks and kernel benchmarks that sit somewhere in the middle. We're doing some part of an interesting research problem. We're not doing the entire thing, though. So let's actually talk about the main subject of this talk, BSM Bench, or the first main subject. BSM Bench is a component benchmark based on a 2010 version of HiRep. Um, this strategy we borrowed from Lucia, um, the paper I've linked at the bottom. So Lucia tested three components the square norm of a matter field, the multiply add of a matter field by a gauge field, and the applying the Dirac operator to the matter field. So to this, we also added a test that the inverter actually converges, because none of the, those three things actually tries to invert anything. And we tested three theories, we, what we call the communications intensive theory, which is SU2 with adjoint matter, balanced, which is SU3 with fundamental matter, also known as QCD, and compute, which is then a, a bigger group, SU6, again with fundamental matter. So something I didn't explicitly say earlier is that because the things you communicate and the things you do compute computation on are different, then changing the gauge group and changing the fermion representation actually changes the relative demands of communication and computation of the machine. So the comms intensive theory has, relative to the amount of stuff it computes, it spends a lot more time getting stuff uh, from other, other MPI racks. Whereas the commute intensive theory spends more of its time 
actually doing computation on the SE6 matrices and less of the time communicating the vectors from the other, uh, the other, the other MPRX. So some technicalities of this. Um, we target a particular runtime um, because that was the advice I was given. I developed the SM bench in the third year, second and third year of my PhD. So I was not very experienced at this point. I was taking a lot of recommendations from people I was working with. One of them was your benchmark should run in less than an hour so that it's not running for multiple days like things like Limpack do. Um, so I picked an arbitrary time and aimed to run for that long. But because I didn't want to spend all of the time checking if it was time to finish yet, I had this strategy of doubling the iteration count after each check. So you run once, you check if you've run for long enough. If not, you go and you run twice, check again. If not, you run four times and check again. Excuse me, and so on. It uses input files exactly the same as you find in HiRep. Um, and it includes a set of input files for the set of tests that you might want to run. So that sets the lattice volume, it sets the parallelization grid, so how you carve up your lattice between your MPI ranks. It also includes the reference floating point operation counts and a whole bunch of other stuff. It removes the code generator in favor of having specific headers for our theories of interest. This means that um, it compiles a bit quicker because you don't have to generate all this. It also means because the code wasn't publicly released at that point, it, I'm not giving away any proprietary research information, which is potentially useful. Um, because we didn't want to license it under the GPL, we removed Ramlux from it. Um, and in 2015, we added OpenMP support because OpenMP wasn't in the 2010 version. I had to backport that from the trunk branch in 2015 specifically so that we could run on Xeon Phi efficiently. Um, because none of the operations we're benchmarking uh, include very much in the way of communications, um, this is added artificially, uh, synthetically, by adding an MPI barrier. And because in 2011 I had no idea how make worked, um, I used the build system in HiRep and then I wrapped it with a shell script uh, that then sets all the right things and calls make a bunch of times, which is not perfect, but it's what, what we had at the time. Uh, it outputs a flops estimate uh, via reference values that I used IBM utilities to do floating point operation counting to get the number. And it outputs that. It also outputs relative performance to an IBM Blue GMP machine, just to give a feel for how fast your machine is compared to what was some, some of the fastest machines in the world at that point. So, limitations of this, the build system was excessively complicated. It has multiple levels where really it shouldn't need them. Uh, it also has artificial synchronization, which makes understanding the, um, how to optimize it more, uh, more confusing. And it means that it's not that representative compared uh, to the research code, which doesn't have artificial synchronization. It actually has synchronization for a reason. Um, we could also only distribute a limited number of input files, um, so expanding to machines that have interesting geometries was challenging. So initially we distributed only powers of two processes, which means when you move to a machine that has a multiple, a factor of three in there, like 36 core nodes, then you have to waste a decent number of the cores, whereas we could construct a geometry that instead has a factor of three in there. Um, we also tested a single lattice volume for consistency, so you can compare running on a really small machine to on a really big machine and see the performance on exactly the same problem. But that's, <coughs> excuse me. Um, that becomes a problem when you say running on a Raspberry Pi, you can't fit the problem in memory. Or when you're running on a supercomputer the size of a large room, then it becomes a problem that you don't have enough lattice sites available to parallelize across all of those cores. So some things it was uh, that it has as a strength. So it had a, a it helped us to identify a number of platform MPI and compiler bugs that we've reported to various vendors. It's also given us a reasonable proxy to application performance on most machines, and various vendors have used it to demonstrate how fast their machine is compared to the rest of the world, which is useful. 
So some results, some plots that I had available. I haven't had time to generate fresh plots for this talk. So we used it to test HPC Wales and compare the Westmere and Sandy Bridge platforms and also the Blue Eyes 2 cluster that was uh, installed at Blind Avon. And we can compare how they perform. You can see Sandy Bridge was performing a lot better than Westmere, it was giving a, a li lot, linear, lot more linear scaling, as well as being slightly faster even at the smallest CPU counts. We've also tested some massively parallel machines, Blue Gene P, Blue Gene Q, and the Fujitsu FX10 machine. And again, you can see when we, when we have this really fast interconnect, we get almost linear scaling on most machines. There were some interesting things we saw on the BlueGP machine where it started to wobble. Um, but mostly we see, especially on the BlueGP, BlueGP is a really good machine. Um, I'm really sad IBM didn't pursue developing it more because it gives us this beautiful linear scaling out to uh, thousands of MPI ranks. So, based on the lessons that we learnt from BSM Bench in 2018, we started developing Sombrero which is an acronym and I can't remember what it stands for. And since I can't, I'm not sure anyone can. Um, I remember it was suite of multiple benchmarks or something. Um, but yes, the, you can see we developed a nice logo for it because we wanted it to be a little bit more uh, popularizable than BSM Bench. And so we had this M that looks like a Mexican hat, which both represents the name Sombrero and also represents the Mexican hat potential I was talking about half an hour ago. So, so I, I really like the fact you're able to make that reference in multiple directions. So rather than the tests we ran based on Lucia, this time we test a fixed number of conjugate, conjugate gradient inversion iterations. So this means we're actually doing exactly the same thing that we were doing in our actual research code. We're doing some kind of uh, inversion, matrix vector inversion. So we test six theories that I'm not going to read out, rather than the three we looked at for BSM Bench. Some technicalities of this, we've streamlined the build, so we use make, we don't have to have a shell script wrapping around it, make does everything for us. We remove the dependence on input files, so we automatically determine how to parallelize our grid, and we have additional flags that let us choose the lattice volume. So we can pick a large volume for a large machine or a small volume for a small machine. And if we want, we can specify the exact volume, or we can just say, give me a very large volume, please, Sombrero. And it does. Um, the full CG inversion from HiRep is used, so the communication pattern is representative of what we do on machines uh, in research code. And we target a fixed iteration number, so on faster machines it runs in less time, rather than always taking the same amount of time. Uh, it also removes the code generator in the same way we did the BSM Bench and for the same reason. So some results from Sombrero. So again, I've not had time to generate results, especially for this talk, but some that I had to hand. Uh, running on Skylake and running on KNL, comparing those, you can see that socket by socket, Skylake and KNL are roughly equivalent to each other, which is interesting. So. Then also comparing AVX2 versus AVX512, you can see AVX512 gives a very small improvement, almost negligible. So Intel, please give us some instruction sets that give us a better improvement on these codes. I don't know. So some conclusions before the call cuts us off. Um, so lattice gauge theory is an important driver of fundamental physics. It's a big consumer of CPU cycles. It uses 20% of CPU cycles in North America, which is incredible. Um, high rep is a piece of software that can perform computations for general, relatively general gauge group and photon representation. So it can do busy on the standard model physics, not just QCD. BSM Bench and Sombrero are benchmarks that I've uh, been involved with developing from this code. Sombrero is more recent and better than BSM Bench for various reasons. Both have been used to characterize some large systems. And BSM Bench in particular has been used by large vendors to help promote their systems and um, find customers who are doing lattice gauge theory. So here are some links if you want to go and find this software and test it out. And that's all I've got. So thank you very much for your attention if you haven't disconnected from the call.